Father, and they love God and God's filled them with His power, they can, in the name of Jesus, pray and demons will absolutely flee. Amen. Zach can cast out devils. He's on fire with God. He's filled with the Holy Ghost. Life given to God, serving God. He would have power to do that through the name of Jesus. Because of the Holy Ghost. No, not because Zach has anything power about it. No. Neither can I. Hey, there's been people I pray for and in the name of Jesus and it didn't happen. There's also been other ones that I've prayed for in the name of Jesus. And they heard that name and they left. We've well, got to be unafraid to pray in that name. We've got to be people of prayer. He said his house will be called a house of prayer. We've got to be a church that believes that prayer is real. Don't tell someone... I'll, I mean, it's okay to tell them that you'll have your pastor pray. That's good to say. But even better to say, but first, why don't we pray together? If you're on a floor in a factory, or you're, you know, say, you know, you can't stop running the machine right now, so you know what? Break will be in 20 minutes. Let's go, uh, let's go to the break room and let's just pray. Stop at Walmart and lay your head, you know, that whole pastor's going to hold hands, or lay your head on their shoulder if you want to. Just say, let's stop and pray. Whatever you're comfortable with and they're comfortable with, and say, hey, let's pray together. Realizing that you have the Holy Ghost and you have the power of God inside of you and you're His child so you have the authority to use His name. Go ahead and pray because God answers prayer. Church, we must be a praying church. In Acts 4.31, they prayed until they moved things or until the heavens moved things. Until the earth was shaken up. James was killed. Peter was in prison. They didn't go, the church didn't go to marching. What did they do today when something happened? They, you know, organized a protest. You know, million men march for this, and nine twelve march for that. I'm not against these marches. I'm not against protests. I think it's some things need to be protested. But you know what? The church is not going to win the world. We're not going to be the church that God calls us to be if we look at protests and boycotts to change things. God wants the church to be a praying people. Amen. We've got to be a people of prayer. We've got to be a people of, uh, of unity. People that believe the same thing. Now, now, once again, not everything we have to agree on. You're going to have a hard time finding two preachers that agree exactly on the rapture. And every one of us would say we, know, we, we think we're pretty much right. But you know what? The most important thing about the rapture that you understand is that He is coming back. Yes. And therefore, you need to make yourself ready whenever it takes place. And so we need to be a people who are unified about some doctrines. Church, we've absolutely got to believe that Jesus died for our sins. We've got to believe He rose on the third day. We've got to believe that that plant, that story of His life, which is called the Gospel, we've got to believe it's the power of God to salvation. But now I want to make a distinction here. You understand that the Gospel, the story, is not the plan of salvation. Do you understand the difference? The story tells what He did to, for, to secure our salvation. But if that's the plan of salvation for us, then everybody would be saved. And the Bible says that hell has gotten bigger. Why? Because people don't want to be saved. People don't want to live for God. And so we've got to make a distinction between the plan of salvation and the Gospel. The Gospel is what Jesus did to secure our salvation. The plan of salvation is what we do to grab a hold of what He gave us. I... I we never did, I don't think. Maybe we did. I can't remember. My family didn't correct me. I know we had an uncle that did it all the time. They, at Christmas, they'd have a box under the tree and they'd open it up and it would say, go look in the garage uh, behind the tires and on the sidewall. And they would go there and it would be a, a note there. It says, now go upstairs to the attic and look underneath the box in the back corner. they go look there and it would say, okay, now go to the refrigerator 
and look at the, you know, and then take them on a, it can be frustrating if you ask me for it's all over with. But you know, there was a process they had to go through to get the gift. The gift was already there, so it had been given to them, and instructions had been laid out. All they had to do was follow the instructions. The gospel has, the, the, the salvation has been provided. The door to heaven is wide open. We just got to follow the instructions. That's the plan of salvation. That's what we do. We've got to be unified about the plan of salvation. We've got to believe with one heart and one soul that people must be born again to be in the kingdom of heaven. We've got to be a, a giving people. Now, honestly, your pastor and other preachers have joked, I've heard it at times, you know, we've got to hesitate saying that in the book of Acts. You know why, don't you? Because in the book of Acts, they sold everything they had and gave it to the church for distribution. What do you do with that? It's a good question. However, you never see Paul telling the church to do that when he was spreading the message to the Gentiles. And just like the church, I mean, the Bible shows people succeeding and people failing. I believe that that is an instance where they show something they tried that just didn't work out right. They ended up causing a family to die because they didn't lie to God. It was their fault, but it put them in a bad position. And we don't see that anywhere else in the New Testament. He talked about matter of fact later it says say bring what you sold and it's like you know bring your offerings and Paul wrote you know you promised this he wrote in one place so make sure you fulfill what you promised and go ahead and bring your offering tithes but I do want to make this point here the church has got to be a given church God gave His Son hello Amen. we've got to give back to Him and I know I talked to someone on Sunday this is discipleship month. And I'm not going to spend much time here, but I want to just make a, a really good illustration here. And, uh, Manuel, would you bring, you got $10 in your pocket. No? Do you? No, you don't. You were here. Five. Uh, no, I'm sorry. You do. Josh. <laughs> bring him up. That's because I sent for Manuel first and found he wasn't here. Josh? You got ten dollars in your pocket, don't you? Can I have ten dollars? All right. Thank you very much. Man, I can use a hundred dollars. I'm being serious, actually. Can't remember what's happening. That shit. <laughs> <laughs> He just had me a hundred dollar bill, didn't think a thing about it. He just had me ten bucks and other than the fact that I was the wrong person to start with, didn't think a thing about it. And you know why they didn't? They knew one of them, it never crossed their minds to just hang on to that and keep it and leave here tonight with it because I called them in the office for service and I gave it to them and said I'm going to ask for it back at some point tonight. It's just what it's not in there. It wasn't in that thought process that I'm going to keep it to go home and spend it. So it is with our ties. Scripture says that when we keep the 10%, we're stealing from God. That means it's His again. Right. Right. We don't really Absolutely. receive tithe. We just, God just takes it back. Right. That's right. And He gives you the rest to manage. Just a simple illustration. They would have never considered it because it really wasn't theirs to begin with. And church, that's the understanding of giving is that we really don't have anything. I came into this world naked and I don't want to leave without anything. And so... It belongs to God. And so we give Him a little bit back. We do what we can to help others. Church, I believe that we've got to have a spirit of giving. Why? Because the love of money, greed, is the root of all kinds of evil. And God can't even bless us until we're able to turn loose of what He asks us to turn loose of in order to meet needs in His kingdom. The early church was a separated church. They preached, Acts 2.40, that they were to save themselves from an untoward generation. Now, how many of you know, we understand here tonight, that you really can't save yourself. Right? We can't just make up our mind and we'll go to heaven and bless God and give us up there. Except to do the way God said. The flip side of that is, 
God's not going to save us either by Himself. Why? Because He said that we have to believe. We have to repent. We have to seek Him. And so, that's why Jesus told the church to go out and make disciples because disciples are not going to line up to be made. Now, have you noticed that people typically don't just <laughs> wake up on Sunday morning and flock to church because it's a thing that they just want to do? I'll guarantee you there's more people at Walmart going through the doors of Walmart any Sunday morning than probably go through all the stores or through all the churches around here. Certainly if you had to follow the stores together. Why? It's not in our hearts that actually want to serve God. So he said, save yourself from this generation. You've got to put some effort into it. You've got to make up your mind to save yourself from this untoward. Untoward what? It's another way of saying ungodly. And oh, I don't even need to get started on how ungodly this world we live in is. The world we live in, is a, in the culture as it is, is a stench really in God's gospels. The early church lived in such a way that they were noticeably different in the life that they lived. That means that there are going to be some things you can't do as a Christian that this world can do. There's going to be some places you won't go as a Christian that maybe someone who's not a Christian would go. I could go into uh, a bar... I, you know, I, I could go to Piggy's and order Mexican food. But you know what? I'm not going to go there. Why? Because I don't care for what they stand for. I don't mind going to a Mexican restaurant. I'll go to the one next door. But you know what? I'm not going to cross over. There's going to be some lines that a person will draw as a Christian that are based on the Word of God. And, and we've got to realize that that's okay. A drowning man doesn't need someone who's unable to swim to jump in and try to save them. People that are people that are depressed and people that are beaten down and people that are oh, you know all wrapped up in the cares of this world, people that are, are bound by the addictions of this world, they don't need someone that's just as bad as they are, talk about how happy God living for God is. They need someone that's had some some experience with being delivered from something. Yes. They need to know that they've come in contact with a church that has the power of God. That has the name of God. That has the experience of God. That's not afraid to give to God. That's not afraid to stand for God. It's not afraid to talk about God. They need to know that they've come to a place where they can learn and grow in God. And a church that is just like everybody else is not going to be that. In the first century, they called themselves the, the way, those that were in the, the way. And I know there's been a lot of jokes made about that at the time. You know, if you're in the way, get out of the way. But they, they recognized it was just a certain way that they were. And because they lived lives that were different and they proclaimed a message that was different. They were persecuted. <coughs> this is my last scene from that church. A church that God builds is going to face opposition. Because if we start being everything God's called us to be and we're praying and we're witnessing and we're discipling ourselves and trying to disciple others if we're doing the things we're given and we're serving and we're being unified about building the kingdom of God, we're going to face opposition. And the enemy of our souls will stir up people to call us names, to file lawsuits against you, to, to let the air out of your tires. You can just get all kinds of creative mischief out there. I'm just pulling things out of the hat. What I'm trying to tell you is the early church was persecuted and when they were persecuted... 
they didn't stop. Right. Have you ever held a water balloon? One hand, or even over just a regular balloon. You squeeze it. I like water balloon illustration better. You squeeze it here, what happens? It gets bigger on the other side. Squeeze that now, what? It's bigger somewhere else. But the devil tried to squeeze the early church. He tried to put the thumb, the, the thumb screws on them. He tried to, to stop them from preaching and teaching and proclaiming Jesus. And the more he tried to squeeze them, the more they just squirted somewhere else. And then when he really cracked down hard and it burst, you know what? That anointing that was inside the church just spread everywhere. So it's no wonder the Bible says they turned their world upside down. The devil didn't, whether well, he realized he didn't mean to, I'm sure. But he actually helped the church to grow. So when we come against opposition, you know what we're supposed to do? The Bible says we're supposed to count it all joy. That's hard. Because we don't like suffering. I haven't heard anybody go, okay, I got cancer. Woohoo, I got fired from my job today. Oh, I'm about to lose my house. I'm about to lose my car. Oh, my kids are in trouble. You know, and that would just be a fruitcake. You think, well, they just had one too many strings snap. But when those things happen, and you look at that person, man, I lost my job today, but you know what? I know God's got it all under control. Bless me in the name of the Lord. Man, I, you know, the doctor said I've got cancer, but you know what? My God's a healer. I'm just going to bleed him for healing until he takes me home. You know what? My kids said, well, I just really made a bad mistake. And they're, they're really going to suffer because of what they're doing. But you know what? I believe that my God is looking out for them and he's, he's just doing his best to pull them home. And they're going to turn around someday. And my God loves them so much, he's going to be right there for them. You see, the early church counted it all joy. Man, God thought I was strong enough to, to allow me to be persecuted. I had faith in these two young guys here tonight that they wouldn't take the money and run. And I could really pick on Benjamin here because not only was it the attitude thing that I trust his character, but I'm his daddy. There's another message there I can preach. But you know what? When we are trusted by God enough, that God goes to Satan and says, have you considered my, my servant Ben? I know Ben, you've got a hedge around him. Okay. Take it down. Really, God? You're going to take the head you got around Ben down? Cool. You just can't kill him. That's all right. I'll have him cussing your name for a while. Modern day version of the story of Job here. But you know what Job didn't realize? Is that inside the hedge that God had around him, there was another wall. And that was one that Job had built. And when God removed his hedge, Job's wall was still there. Job had a life and a commitment of I came into this world naked. I'm going to leave without anything. Well, that's to be the name of the Lord. Oh, Lord. I, I, my body is sick. Skin worms are destroying it. You know what? I did my body. I'm going to see God. Job had an attitude that no matter what this world did to him, he was going to serve the Lord. And church, when God counts you so strong that he will allow his hands to drop and you to stand on your own. You know that God is trusting you. You know that you've got God's attention. That God looks at one of you as one of his, his faithful soldiers. <coughs> How many of you guys like a, a good war movie or a good war story? Well, I, I read those Tom uh, Clancy uh, novels and stuff like that. Those secret ops guys and boy, the stuff they do. One of makes me wish I was younger again. But that thing I really want to be shot at. But they were talking about them on the radio today. How that people that succeed in special ops, and this is my final story, that people that succeed in special ops, they typically 
in their physical test have high levels of testosterone. Now, does that surprise anybody? No. You know what it means? It means that they had the right stuff in their body, the right makeup to give them a little bit of extra fear. It said that one, they were able to handle the rigors of training, and two, their fight or flight reflex was was good. In other words, they, they had a good instinct about when they had to run, but they didn't just run in the first option. Oh, the Holy Ghost says to me, that's when we're supposed to be as Christians, because we've got the right stuff inside of us. We're the apostolic church. We're the Jesus name people. We're the ones that have been filled with the Holy Ghost. We've got the right stuff in us. And when God lets us go through something, we've got the right knowledge. God will tell us uh, by that chemical that's inside of us, the Holy Ghost, if you will. He'll let us know whether we need to come running to Daddy and say, Daddy, you take care of this one. Or whether we stand up and say, in the name of Jesus Christ, I rebuke you. Church, we've got the goods. And God's want us to be a book of Acts church. Modern day, 21st century, Angola, Indiana, Book of Acts Church with the Book of Acts Revival. Well, people were receiving a Book of Acts experience. Can somebody say amen? Stay with me tonight. They learned to count it all joy. Lift your hands with me right now. Let's give him praise and good honor. Lord, we worship you, Jesus. We praise your name, God. We thank you for your goodness and your mercy, God. Lord, tonight, God, I want to thank you for your word, the pattern that I see in it, God, the things, Lord, that you've laid before us, God. We're not yet what we need to be. But God, I know that you're taking us on a journey. God, I know that right now this room is filled with people, God, that want to do a work for you. People, God, that want to see revival break out. People that want to see lives changed. God, make us all soul winners, God. Make us all worshipers, Lord. Make us all strong, Lord. Able to stand persecution. Lord, give us a spirit of unity about everything we do, God. 